going to draw a picture of a cathode ray tube here. Tell me, please, what this part of the cathode ray tube should be labeled as. This part right here that is closest to the negative side of the power supply. <coughs> the cathode, yeah. It's called the cathode. This is called the anode. J.J. Thompson, in 1897, along with a bunch of other people before him, noticed that when you flip the switch and turn this thing on, something left the cathode, went toward the anode, and if you had a hole through the anode, it would go right through and strike the screen down there. Nobody could figure out what this was. A lot of people theorized that it was just light, electromagnetic radiation. Some people even theorized that it was particles. But nobody really knew what this was. Thompson came along and introduced something down here. What did he put down here in order to see what these things were? Yeah, he put a magnetic field in there. We've got the magnetic field drawn into the page, but of course, it doesn't have to be into the page. It can be, as long as it's perpendicular to the way this cathode ray is moving, then we should be good. What happens to this cathode ray, this green mysterious ray, as it goes through this external magnetic field? Well, if it's oriented the way that it is, it's going to curve downwards like this. What did that tell Thompson way back 116 years ago? the fact that these cathode rays were deflected downwards in this magnetic field pointing into the page. No, didn't tell him that yet. Yeah, that's what he got from it in the end, but that's not the conclusion that he could draw from this. Yeah, we say it's smaller than the atom. It, it is. It is definitely smaller than the atom. But the fact that these things were deflected in the magnetic field is evidence for some of the conclusion that he made, but certainly not all of it. Holly? Good. Negatively charged particles. Only negatively charged particles would be deflected in that direction in that magnetic field. Look, in the early 1800s, we knew about the relationship, or at least part of the relationship, between electricity and magnetism. We knew about electric charge. We just didn't know about electrons. So we knew full well, long before Thompson ever came along, that if a negatively charged particle was exposed to that magnetic field, it would deflect downward. The only logical conclusion that he could draw from this is that these beams of, of these cathode rays, these beams emanating from the cathode, must be negatively charged particles. Well, he went on to do the same analysis as we usually do when we see a charged particle going in a circle in a magnetic field. He said Fc is equal to Fm. Mv squared over R, the centripetal force, equals... QVB. These cancel. We get MV over R equals Q times B. He knows what the value of R is simply by where it hits the screen. He knows what the value of B is because he introduced B, the magnetic field. But he still doesn't know what M is. He doesn't know what speed is. He doesn't know what Q is. So there's three unknowns in this one equation, and that doesn't seem to be very good. So then he does something over here in the middle. What is it exactly the, that he introduces here in the middle? Yep. Good, an electric and a magnetic field. It doesn't matter which way we have it, but let's say in this scenario, we have the magnetic field pointing into the page. That would once again cause a magnetic force pointing toward the bottom of the page. He also introduced, as Patrick said, an electric field that in this case would cause an electric force on these cathode rays, these negatively charged particles that would point upwards. Now, if some of these charged particles are not going at the right speed, then they will experience either a magnet, an electric force or a magnetic force bigger than the other one. If the magnetic force is bigger, what's going to happen to these particles? If Fm is bigger than Fe, what's going to happen to these particles? If I push on you that way, and somebody else pushes on you this way, the force that's bigger is the force that's going to win, right? If Fm is bigger, Fm wins. What happens to the particles? They go down. They, they are deflected downwards. Now, if Fe is bigger than Fm, they'll be deflected upwards. Some of the particles will go upwards, some will go downwards. We don't care about those ones. We care about the ones that are going at just the right speed. 
the perfect speed so that Fe is equal to Fm. Tell me what's going to happen to those particles, the ones that have Fe equal to Fm, the ones that are going at just the right speed to accomplish that. Where are they going to go? Sometimes particles go up, sometimes particles go down. If this condition is met, then the particles will go straight through. Undeflected. Those are the ones we care about because those are the ones that are entering this blue chamber over here, this main chamber we call it. And then we can do the analysis that we've just done. Fe is equal to Fm, Qe is equal to QVB, Qs cancel. V ends up being equal to, equal to E, electric field over B, the magnetic field. Let's get the value for V. Let's get the value for the speed of these particles. Not all of them, just the ones that are going straight through. Then let's take that value and plug it into here. Now we have three givens and only two unknowns. Thompson couldn't go any further, so what did he do? What did he solve for here? How can you solve for anything if you have two unknowns? Solve for ratio. All right, we talked about this yesterday. The ratio of my age to your age is two and a half to one. Okay, that's not as good as knowing how old you are and knowing how old I am, but it's better than nothing. It's more information than we had before. The ratio of the charge to mass is 1.76 times 10 to the 11. That's not as good as knowing what the charge is or knowing what the mass is, but it's better than nothing. Take the m over by dividing, the b over by dividing, and we end up with v over b times r. And again, when we do that math, we end up getting 1.76 times 10 to the 11 coulombs per kilogram. What did that tell him, the value that he got for q over m, the charge to mass ratio? What information did that provide for him? What conclusion did he draw from that? Yeah, well, you, the, you have the ratio of E over B, but you know what the value of E was, and you know what the value of B was. So if you know what E is in the, in the velocity selection chamber there, and you know what B is, then you can find the speed of the particles. But the speed, now, I mean, the question you ask, you're right. The speed of the particles is going to be the ratio of the electric field to the magnetic field. So if you know what that ratio is, you know what the speed is, you plug it back into there. What did that number tell him? We get a number that's... It's kind of unique here. What's unique about it? Its size, what about it? Big, small? Yeah, it's very, very big. It's bigger than, in fact, any charge to mass ratio that had ever been measured. The smallest thing that had ever been measured prior to that was a hydrogen atom, one proton, no neutrons. Okay, this has a charge to mass ratio that's way bigger than that. That means the mass is going to be way smaller. If you've got a mass that's smaller than a hydrogen nucleus, which is the smallest nucleus we have, then this thing must be subatomic. It's got to be smaller than the nucleus. It's got to be smaller than the atom. It's a subatomic particle. We already knew that it was negative. Now that we know that it's a negative subatomic particle, what do we call a negative subatomic particle? Electron. All right, let's take a look at the homework we had on 760 first. Questions 1 and 3 to 10. Then we'll go back and take a look at that reading if we need to go over any questions for that. Any issues with page 760, number 1, 3 to 10? Number 10, yeah. Any others besides number 10, please? Tenor? 1. Yeah, 9, 9B. Okay. Yeah, we'll, we'll do the whole thing. 1, 9, and 10. Any others? Going once, going twice. Okay, number 1 says an electron moving at 5 meters per second enters a magnetic field of magnitude 100 millitesla. 100 times 10 to the minus 3 tesla. What's the maximum force? And then in question B, we're asked, what's the minimum force? This isn't really a cathode ray tube question. In fact, a lot of these questions on this page aren't cathode ray tube questions. They're background to the cathode ray tube. Can we talk about magnetic force within the cathode ray tube? Here's a straightforward magnetic force problem. I shouldn't say straightforward. It's, it's, a, it's a bit of a tough question. But if you think back to our magnetism unit, you can answer this. 
the maximum force on any charged particle in any magnetic field is equal to QVB. That assumes that the particle is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field. If they are, if the particle is moving perpendicular to the magnetic field, you will get the maximum force, and you can use this equation to get it. So let's multiply these three numbers together. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 times the speed times 100 times 10 to the minus 3. It's going to give us whatever value for force, which will again be the maximum force. The minimum force? When does the minimum force occur? What is the value of the minimum force? The minimum force is zero. And when does that occur, Rob? When they're parallel to each other. So when the charged particle is moving parallel to the field, when it's moving in the same direction as the field or opposite to the field, the angle is either zero or 180. We can say that the minimum force occurs at that point, and the value of that force would be zero newtons. Does that ring a bell, everyone? QVB when they're perpendicular, okay, zero when they're parallel to each other, and somewhere in between zero and QVB when they're and, and at some angle in between zero and 90 degrees, although we won't have to worry about that. Let's take a look at number nine now. This one says, this shows a diagram the diagram shows a proton moving at 1.0 times 10 to the 5 meters per second through perpendicular electric and magnetic fields. What's the net force acting on the particle? And question B, will the net force change over time? Explain your reasoning. Let's get the net force acting on the particle first in question A. Can you tell me, please, in question A, what kinds of forces do we have? If we're looking for the net force, presumably we have more than one force. What are the forces that act on this particle in question A? Dan? The magnetic force and the electric force. Good. Um, we got a positive particle here. We have an electric field pointing downward. Which way is the electric force if the particle is positive and the field is down? Positive particles experience a force, an electric force, that is, in the direction of the field. If it was a negative particle with a downward field, the force would be up, opposite to the direction of the field. What about the magnetic force? We've got to use a hand rule for this one, right? It's positive, so let's use our right hand. Thumb to the right, fingers out of the page in the direction of the field, palm points down. The magnetic force is also downward. Now, we calculate the net force. We say Fe plus Fm. Fe is Q times E. Fm is QVB. Can we cancel out a Q there? It appears in every term on the right side, but not on the left side. So no, we can't cancel it out. Uh, we calculate those numbers. We make them both negative because they're both downward. We end up getting a net force here of whatever newtons. Now, question B, here's the real tough one. Question B says, will the net force change over time? Anybody have an answer for that? Well, let me give you the answer my period two class gave me this morning. They said, no, the net force won't change over time. I said, why? They said, well, the electric field is uniform, so the electric force will stay the same. The magnetic field is uniform, so the magnetic force will stay the same. So therefore, when you add them up, they will continue being the same value. Sounds good, right? You know where I'm going with this, though, right? It's not going to stay the same. It is going to change. Go ahead, Holly. The speed doesn't change, but the velocity changes. What am I doing to distinguish the difference there? Direction. There's an electric force that's downward, and it will always be downward in an electric field that's downward. So the electric force isn't going to change value, and it's not going to change direction. But the magnetic force, on the other hand, although the speed stays the same and its magnitude will stay the same, its direction will change. Because as this particle moves to the right initially, 
it will be pushed downward. As it's pushed downward, it starts moving this way. When it starts moving this way, the magnetic force acts this way. If you have a downward electric force and a magnetic force at an angle, they don't add up in the same way as those two forces added up in question A. Does that make sense? Question B, the answer is yes. The net force will change over time. Not because the magnitude of the two forces change, they don't. But the direction of one of them does. Yep. Yep. Yes, yes. Yes, because we're told here that the magnetic field is out of the page. So my, I'm using my right hand because it's a positive particle. My right hand thumb towards the left side of the page, fingers out of the page in the direction of the field, palm points downward. Now, don't ever get that mixed up with the electric field. For electric field, we never use a hand rule. For magnetic field, we always use a hand rule. Let's take a look now, please, at question number 10. Bit of an unrealistic question, but let's go with it anyways here. Question says, suppose that a passenger accumulates 5 microcoulombs of charge, negative charge, while walking from left to right across a carpeted floor to the security gate at an airport. If the metal detector at the security gate exerts an upward force, an upward magnetic force, what's the direction of the magnetic field within the detector? So the magnetic force is upward. The velocity of the person, who is really the charge here, is to the right. Which way is the magnetic field within the detector? Left hand rule for deflection because it's a negative particle. Thumb in the direction of the particle, which is to the right. Palm points, palm points upward because the force is upward here. So we're going to say thumb, palm upwards. My fingers point which way? <coughs> out of the page. So the magnetic field here is going to be out of the page. B, the metal detector uses a 0 0.05 Tesla magnetic field. Roughly how fast would the passenger have to run through the detector in order to feel weightless? In other words, in order to be suspended. If the person is suspended, we have to have what condition met? Good. Two forces have to balance each other. And in this case, it will be the gravitational force and the magnetic force. Opposing each other, but equal in magnitude to give us a net force of zero. So let's set those two equal to each other. Fm equals Fg. We're going to say QVB equals M times G. And we're going to rearrange this to solve for V. V ends up being equal to Q times B over M times g. Our issue with this is that we don't know what mass is, right? It doesn't matter. How much do you weigh? What's your mass in kilograms? Anybody? Uh, it would be, yes, you're right. mg over qb it would be. Thank you. Thank you. Sergio, what's your mass, roughly, in kilograms? What's your weight in pounds? 140. So you're about 65 kilograms-ish. 65 kilograms. Let's use Sergio's weight, or mass here. Okay, 65 kilograms times 9.81 divided by the charge here that Sergio gains as he walks across his carpet here. This will teach him, by the way, to put carpet down in a secure area of an airport. People can levitate. All you have to do is run. I wouldn't recommend that, by the way. Running through the security metal detector at an airport is probably a good way to get yourself killed. I wouldn't recommend doing that. 5 times 10 to the negative 6, B, the magnetic field, is 0 0.05 Tesla. Sergio, you've got to run 2.55. 2.6, we'll say. 
times 10 to the 9 meters per second. Sergio's quick. I don't think he's that quick, though. He's not that quick because that's almost 10 times the speed of light, and even Sergio can't run any faster than the speed of light. Now, had we chosen a different mass, Sergio's 65 kilograms. Let's say we choose somebody else that's 100 kilograms. Is it going to matter? It's not, it's not going to make any difference. So you get a value that's instead of 2.6 times 10 to the 9, you get 3 point something that's times 10 to the 9. Any way you look at it, if you have a mass of a human being, there is no way that you're going to be able to levitate in the magnetic field of this, of this airport scanner. Here's the thing, the two things. One, you don't want to run that fast through an airport. Okay? It, it, it raises suspicion when you run that fast through an airport. The second thing is, if you can run 10 times the speed of light, why would you fly in an airplane? I got to uh, fly to Halifax this summer, and it's a, about a five-hour flight. Uh, if I could run 10 times the speed of light, I would just run, like a tiny fraction of a second. So ob obviously, it's, it's not a particularly practical to use this as a levitation device, because you have to be running way too fast. Or what's the alternative? As opposed to be running that fast, you'd have to have a charge that was much, much greater. The reality is the amount of charge that you'd have to carry in order to, in order to levitate by not running an incredibly high speed would be so massive, such a massive amount of charge, there's no way your body could hold it. You'd discharge. So you'd either have to run faster than the speed of light, which is impossible, or you'd have to hold more charge than your body can possibly hold. So it's not practical. It's not even possible, let alone practical. Okay, let's take a look at this one now. This uh, reading that we had on 759. Any issues with that uh, on 759, please? One, two, or three. Going once. Yep, three. Number three. So from perspective, what this mass spectrometer does is measures uh, what kind of material we have. We take an unknown sample, we turn it into a gas, we ionize it, and then we send these ions through this mass spectrometer, which effectively amounts to the same thing as a cathode ray tube. It measures the properties of these ions. That determines uh, what ions are present, but it also can determine how much of it's present based on how much current is generated of this detector. So we identify what we've got, and we identify how much we've got. Question number three says, Describe how you could use a mass spectrometer to detect an athlete's use of a band performance enhancing drug. Even if you can't detect directly the performance enhancing drug, which it's quite likely you won't, you can detect indirect evidence of the use of performance enhancing drugs. How do they do a drug test? Uh, usually it's a urine sample. At least a first test would be a urine sample, although they could do it with blood too, I would expect. Take a urine sample, vaporize it, ionize it, send it through this mass spectrometer. What comes out the other end? Oh, testosterone. Hey, you're a guy. You've got test girls, girls have testosterone. So we know there's testosterone there, but if you've got way more than your, natu your body naturally produces, and we can detect that with the mass spectrometer via this detector and how much current is generated there, get way more than that tells us that you've gotten it somehow artificially. And it doesn't really matter how you've gotten it. As long as you've gotten it artificially, it's against the rules. OK, does that make sense? Oh, yeah, yeah, it would, I, I would think. I mean, I don't know a whole lot about drug testing, but I would think that it would almost always be indirect evidence. Um, I would think that you wouldn't be detecting the presence of the, the actual drug but you'd be detecting the effect of the drug, I believe. Okay. I've never had a drug test in my life. And even people that have uh, probably don't know actually what they're looking for, just that they're looking for evidence of drugs, right? But, but I think it would be the indirect evidence, yeah. OK, today we're going to move on to uh, Millikan's oil drop experiment. Yesterday, we looked at Thompson's cathode ray tube, and we learned yesterday that there is something smaller than the atom. 
we learn some of the properties of that thing that's smaller than the atom, the electron, specifically the charge to mass ratio. Today, we're going to learn not only the charge to mass ratio, but the charge specifically and the mass specifically. So it's kind of like the analogy we looked at yesterday. The guy comes into the classroom and says, how old are you? How old are you? We're not telling, but we'll give you our age ratio. Okay? Yesterday, we came out with the ratio of our ages. Today, we're going to come out with each of our ages. Okay, today, we're going to come out with the charge and the mass. The picture you see on the left-hand side, I'm not going to ask you to draw. I'm just going to briefly explain what's going on because it's a really good diagram. The picture on the right is going to be a simplified diagram, and it's going to be a little bit bigger so you can see what's going on in there. Okay, what happens over here is that we, we take this, this thing that we call an atomizer. It's basically like a perfume dispenser. You ever spray perfume, you know that it's a liquid. You spray it with this little nozzle, and it, and it turns it into this, this tiny little mist. We atomize it. Now, we're not literally turning this mist particles into the size of atoms, but we're making them really, really small. Okay, so we say we've atomized it. These perfume molecules may gain a charge, bless you, as they rub against the nozzle of this atomizer, as they rub against the nozzle of the perfume dispenser. Here, instead of spraying perfume, we're spraying oil. We take a certain kind of oil that's not going to evaporate in the process of doing this. Okay, this oil, as it rubs against the nozzle of the atomizer, and becomes these tiny, fine little mist particles, will gain a charge. They will also fall. They fall down here into this little hole right here that exists in a positively charged plate positively charged because of our power supply right here. We also have a negatively charged plate down here, by the way. When these charged oil droplets exist between this positive and negative charged plate, they will experience an electric force. We can use that electric force along with a couple of other things to ultimately get the charge of an electron. Now, let's go over to the diagram on the right-hand side. This is going to be a simplification, and it's going to show us exactly what's happening inside those parallel plates. We got a positive uh, charge right there, a positive side of the battery right there, a negative side right there, giving us a positive plate and a negative plate. We could reverse that. It wouldn't make, wouldn't make a big difference. This would still work if the battery was switched around. When we spray these, these, this oil through this atomizer, and it becomes these tiny little oil drops, some of them will be negatively charged and some of them will be positively charged. Some of them will be neutral, but we're not going to pay much attention to those. Some positive, some negative. The particles that are positive will experience two forces. Can anybody tell me what one of those forces are? Gravity. Okay, it's an oil drop. It's got mass will experience a force of gravity downwards. And in fact, the other one will also experience a force of gravity downwards. What's the other force? We alluded to it just a minute ago. The electric force. Which way is the electric force on this positive oil drop? The electric field goes this way. The electric force on a positive particle is in the direction of the field. So we're going to say Fe is downwards there. Fe is upwards on this one because it's always opposite to the direction of the field in a negative particle. This is the one that we're concerned with right now. And specifically, we're concerned with a very special case of this, a special case in which this particle either is suspended or travels up or down at a constant speed. If these forces aren't balanced, it's going to accelerate, as does the positive particle accelerate downward. But if these forces are balanced, if these forces equal each other, then this particle will either be suspended, stay where it is, or it may travel up or down, but it will always be at a constant speed. In other words, it won't accelerate. For particles that are suspended, or traveling at a constant speed, we know that the electric force upward must equal the gravitational force downward. Or QE must equal M times G. 
rearrange it and solve for Q. We get mg over E. Now, sometimes you're given the value for E. Sometimes you've got to find it using the parallel plate equation. Either way, it's not that tough. Plug your numbers into this expression. Get a value for Q, the charge. The charge not of an electron, but rather the charge of an oil drop. We've just found the charge of an oil drop. That oil drop might have a charge that is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Or it might be 9.6 times 10 to the minus 18 coulombs. Or it might be 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Or it might be 4.8 times 10 to the minus 17 coulombs. Or it could be 6.4 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. It could be any one of a number of things. In fact, we would perform this experiment hundreds of times so that we could get the charge of hundreds of different oil drops. Each one of these oil droplets, however, has a charge that is either 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 or a whole number multiple of it. 3.2 times 10 to the minus 19 is twice that value. 9.6 times 10 to the minus 18 is 60 times that value. 300 times that value, 4 times that value. Each of the charges of each of the oil droplets that are measured are going to be a whole number multiple of 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That leads Millikan to two conclusions. One, there is what we call an elementary charge. There is a charge that is the minimum possible charge, a charge in which you cannot get a lower number. The smallest possible charge that you can have, the elementary charge, is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. And because an electron is a subatomic particle, Millikan reasoned that the charge of that electron is the same as the elementary charge, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. The other thing he concluded from this is the charge is quantized. What does that mean? You can have certain values of charge, but not other values. When I walk up a set of stairs, let's say I step on the first step, and I have 100 joules of potential energy on that first step. Going to the second step, I have 200 joules. Third step, I have 300 joules. Fourth step, I have 400 joules. My energy is quantized. I can only have 100 or 200 or 300 or 400, nothing in between. Charge is quantized. You can only have 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19, or twice that, or 60 times that, or 300 times that, or 4 times that, but not 2.6 times that. The elementary charge, the charge of the electron, and charge is quantized. Only certain values allowed. Here's an example at 763. It says an oil drop has a mass of 8.2 times 10 to the 15 and is suspended in an electric field. We know that the problems that we encounter won't all involve particles that are suspended. This one is. If it's suspended or traveling at a constant speed, we know that Fe must equal Fg. So let's do that. Qe is equal to mg solve for q. What do we get for that? 8.0 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. That's the charge. But how many electrons is that? Well, we know how to do that, right? The number of electrons is simply equal to the total charge. 8.0 times 10 to the negative 19 divided by the charge of one electron. 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. That gives me 5. 
There's five electrons. But is it gained or lost? That's the tough part of this question, really is. Gained or lost. Let's draw it out. Here's my parallel plates. We have an electric field that we're going to label as being downwards. We have a particle that experiences a downward gravity force. And because it's suspended, it must be an upward electric force. Not all particles will experience an upward electric force, but the ones that are suspended must. It's got to counter gravity. We learned way back in February and March that a charged particle that is positive will experience a force in the direction of the electric field. A charged particle that's negative will experience a force opposite to that. This one experiences a force opposite to the field which means it must be a negative particle. If it was positive, it would experience the force in the same direction as the field. Dan? That means, yes, it means that it's gained electrons. If you have something that's neutral, and you want to make it negative, you're not going to take away negative. You're going to add negative. So it must have gained electrons. Go ahead. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, assume that the uh, this uh, little bubble of oil was neutral in the beginning, sure. And now that it's now it's going to be charged, either positive or negative, it's going to have five either excess electrons or five less electrons than protons. We know in this case that it's gained electrons because the electric force has to be opposite to the field. And that can only happen in a negative particle. Is that OK? All right, I'd like you to take a look, please, at the practice questions on page 763. All right, everyone, let's take a look at both of these questions, one and two, at least the second part of each of them. Not so much the mathematics. It's relatively straightforward, actually. Question number one, we're simply going to look for the charge. And to get the charge, we're going to say, of course, Fe equals Fg. The forces have got to balance because it's suspended. Qe is equal to mg. We're going to rearrange it to solve for Q. And then we're going to take that value for charge. And since we're looking for the number of electrons, divide the total charge by the charge for one electron. And when we do that, we should get three. Now, it works out to be 2.9, actually, but it rounds to 3, of course. Now, how do we know whether these electrons are gained or lost, whether the particle is negative or positive? Let's draw a picture. We always should draw the picture. It helps. We have an electric field that is upward. We have a particle, positive or negative, we're not sure, that experiences a force of gravity down and experiences a, a uh, electric force up. It must. If it's suspended, these two forces have to oppose each other. Gravity is always down, so the electric force has to be up. If the electric force is in the same direction as the electric field, what do we know about that particle? It's got to be positive. If it was negative, the force would be opposite to the direction of the electric field. It's got to be a positive particle. And if it's a positive oil drop, then it's gained or lost electrons. Lost. Yeah, if it's neutral and it becomes positive, you don't become positive by gaining negatives. You become positive by losing negatives. So it's going to be three electrons lost. Let's take a look at number two. Number two, a little bit easier mathematically. Once again, we're going to balance the electric force with the gravitational force because it says it's suspended. We're going to say QE is equal to mg. And we're going to rearrange this to solve for E. E is equal to mg over Q. You get the value there, 9.8 times 10 to the 5 newtons per coulomb. Now let's look at which way this field is. We have two plates. We have a positive oil drop in between those two plates. We know that the gravitational force must be down. And the electric force, since it's suspended, 
It must oppose that. In fact, it must balance it. The electric force is up. If you have an upward force on a positive particle, then that must mean the field is which way? The field is all the force, I should say, is always in the direction of the field if it's a positive particle. It's opposite to the direction of the field if it's a negative particle. So the force is upward. In this case, again, the field must be upwards as well. Now let's take a look at the oil drops that aren't suspended or aren't traveling at a constant speed. Let's take a look at these particles that are either positively charged and therefore experience two forces, the electric force and the force of gravity downwards. It clearly, in that case, it's not going to be suspended. It's going to accelerate downward at a rate that's greater than 9.81. But we could also include with that the negative particle that experiences a force of gravity down in an electric force up if one of those two forces is bigger than the other. So either scenario, as long as Fe does not balance Fg. For an oil drop that is accelerating either up or down, we're going to go back to physics 20 stuff. F net is equal to Fe plus Fg. F net is equal to the sum of those forces. What was the next step that we did in physics 20? We replaced F net with M times A. So typically what's going to happen here is you're going to have the mass, you're going to have the acceleration either up or down. Make sure you put in the correct sign, positive and negative for up or down. You're going to have the electric field strength. You're going to have mass. You're going to have G. And you're going to solve for Q. Then you do the exact same thing as Millikan did in the first setup. You know you're going to get a charge that's either 1.6 or a multiple of that. Go from there just like you did in the first setup. Be careful about signs down here, okay? In this case, the Fe would be positive because it's upwards. Fg would be negative because it's downwards. Okay, A, positive if it accelerates up, negative if it accelerates down. Let's take a look at one question that goes with that. And then that's our last example for the day. A tiny plastic sphere of mass 8.2 times 10 to the negative 15 is placed in an electric field that is downward within a vacuum chamber. The sphere has 10 excess electrons on it. That means that Q is negative 1.60 times 10 to the minus 18 coulombs. Negative because it's a bunch of extra electrons. Uh, 10 to the negative 18 because it's 10 extra electrons. We want to know if it accelerates or not. Well, the best way to see if it accelerates is to calculate the acceleration. If the acceleration is zero, the answer is no, it doesn't accelerate. If it's not zero, then the answer is yes, it accelerates. There is an electric field downward. It is a negative particle. It experiences a force of gravity downward. It experiences an electric force which way? Dan? Sorry? Yeah, sorry. The electric field is upwards. It must be opposite to the direction of the field because it's a negative particle. Pay attention to signs here. The electric force, although the field is down, the electric force 
is up, so we'll make that positive. The force of gravity is down, so we'll make that negative. Let's calculate that. We're going to say 1.6 times 10 to the minus, 9, uh, minus 18 times 1 times 10 to the 5 equals 1.6 times 10 to the minus 13. Subtract from that, some brackets, 8.2 times 10 to, the, 10 to the 15, 10 to the minus 15, times 9.81, equals, on the right-hand side here, 7.9558 times 10 to the minus 14. We divide that by 8.2 times 10 to the minus 15, and we get 9.7 meters per second squared. It's positive. What does that mean? It accelerates upward. Yeah. It's not suspended. No, no. So the question says, does it accelerate? The answer is... Yes. The only way the answer would be no is if we had have just calculated A and it worked out to be zero. Then we could say that it didn't accelerate. All right? Please try the questions on page 674. 764, please. 764, questions one and two. One quick note here. These two answers are both incorrect. So if you get that answer, if you get either one of those answers, make sure you check your work, because you're actually wrong if you get the answer that they give you in the book.